Hello and welcome to Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast. I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser, the director of the Dolby Institute, and welcome to this week's episode. I'm excited this week to uh, be talking about a new movie that's out in the theaters and on video on demand right now called The Killing of Two Lovers. Um, this is a movie that made quite a splash at Sundance in 2020. It is written, directed, produced, and edited by Robert Machoian, and it has truly amazing sound design from a really talented artist named Peter Albrechtson, who lives and works in Copenhagen. I am really excited to have this show on our podcast and talk about it because it really encapsulates a lot of the things that, um, that we talk about a lot in terms of the importance of sound design for movies and how to use sound as a storytelling tool. Um, this is, you know, I think a lot of people, even in our industry, tend to think of sound design as something as like, okay, well, that's something for big budget Hollywood studio tentpole movies and, you know, animated films and, and uh, big action movies. And this could not be more different than that. It is a low budget, scrappy, independent movie. I think they shot it in 12 days. But the sound is such a driver of the story. It's really just an amazing track to listen to. So uh, I, we're going to get it into some spoilers in this episode. If you haven't watched The Killing of Two Lovers yet, I really suggest that you hit pause, uh, see if it's showing in a theater near you, go see it, or if not, watch it on VOD, and then come back and listen to this conversation. Because we really kind of uh, dive under the, open the hood and dive in and really talk about, you know, how... Robert and Peter use sound to create the world that these characters inhabit and also how to, they use sound to reflect the like the distressed mental states of some of the of the characters in the film. So uh, this is really uh, my, my, a, a great example of um, my old boss, George Lucas, was famous for saying that sound is 50 percent of the motion picture experience. In this case, for Robert and his film, uh, he literally spent 50 percent of his budget on the sound design and the mix of the film. And uh, I'm not saying that you have to do that in order to have great sound in your movie, uh, but uh, it really is a testament to how uh, the attention that was paid to sound design in this film. And, and uh, Robert talks about thinking about sound when he wrote the script um, and, and, and what an important part of the storytelling process it is for him. So let's dive in and listen to uh, these two artists talk about the killing of two lovers. One of the things that we talk about uh, on this program a lot is is the power of the first 10 minutes of the film and the, the responsibility that you as filmmakers have, because in that first 10 minutes, you're really establishing, you know, the cinematic language that you're going to use to tell the story. You're putting the audience in the world. Obviously, you're doing the stuff that everybody knows about, which is you're introducing the characters. But most importantly, you're also I think that not a lot of people talk about the fact that you're you're setting the tone. And you're also explaining to the audience how it is that you're going to go about telling this particular story. Our friends at Neon have been very gracious to give us some clips from the first 10 minutes of the film. And so, Robert, I'd love to just kind of, and Peter, just kind of deconstruct what you had to accomplish in that first 10 minutes from a stylistic standpoint and um, how you and Peter went about doing that. Because one of the things that's really interesting and that became apparent to me right very clearly on, and this follows through with what you were talking about about your the, the previous film, very different things are being accomplished by the image and the sound in that first 10 minutes. I mean, it was uh, pretty amazing in many ways. Get just getting like Robert sent me the like the first cut of his his and like first cut of the film, and we had talked about 
uh, musik konkret, this uh, style of music invented back in the 40s in France, where you play music, but you use sounds as instruments instead of using proper instruments. And Robert, I've been talking a lot about this. Um, so for me, when I, when I saw that opening, uh, which was there already in the first cut, um, I was like, okay, so this is the place where we do something that has this musique concrète style where you use sounds in a musical way. And I was like, okay, there's, um, there's this whole thing in the film where it's so much about the main character in his car, driving in his car, being around his car. The car felt like such a, like an, a, a, a character in the film. And I thought, okay, let's try and use the sounds of the car for his internal sonic voice in a way. And uh, I collected lots of different sounds like car doors closing, car alarms. Uh, I had uh, together with my um, assistant, uh, I, we had recorded some smashing up cars like a couple of years previously. So I had all these crazy sounds of metal screeching and all this. So I put together like a, a, a piece of kind of music concrete with like based on all these sounds, which is the thing you hear in the beginning of the film when he's running down the street. Um, and the thing was that for me doing this and sending this off to Robert, I was like, oh my, my God, this is crazy. He's going to think that I'm a madman. What will happen now? In a, in a moment, he'll call me and say, okay, this is too crazy. I'm finding someone else who can do a proper job on the sound for this film. But what happened was that like a week went by and then after I had sent this, this idea to Robert, um, a week went by, then Robert sent a new version of the cut. And these, this sound collage that I had made suddenly was in five different places in the movie. And places that I wouldn't have never thought of, like to cut in this kind of these kind of sounds. So that is very much like how we how our collaboration is that we try out experiments and then as like it's it's a very creative collaboration where like the opposite part then kind of moves on and inspired by what the other one has done and that is how this whole sonic style of the film really developed that sending ideas back and forth but it was it this whole this whole sound symphony <laughs> was really like it was based on this first idea created for the opening of the film robert have anything to add to that yeah, I mean, one of the things that, that was very exciting that, that Peter and I began to kind of explore early on, which I think is very neat, is not only the the sound itself, but the absence of sound as well. Um, and so that opening, really, it's almost as if there is no sound. There There is, you can hear the wind, you know, slowly blowing and some of the wood boards creaking, but it, it set a tone for me that was very exciting that, that we were going to, we weren't always going to be playing high notes, but when we would drop the notes down, that they would be very deliberate. And so the sound in and of itself, its significance, the absence of, absence of sound significant as well. So that, that was very exciting for me. I'm glad you mentioned the kind of the ubiquitous wind and the, the floor creaking. One of the things, one of the things I've, one of the things I felt watching the film was like, uh, it, the sound gave me a sense of how cold this place is. Um, and, you know, Peter, obviously being in Copenhagen, you, you know, cold. So, um, uh, yeah, that, that was a, that was a great addition, but I, I think it's important to point out that like, you know, Peter, you can't work your magic like that in a vacuum. You have to have a film and, and, an edit that supports that kind of treatment. And Robert, the way you know, the way you filmed this and the way you edited it, you know, largely, I, I'd love for you to talk about kind of 
you know, creatively and stylistically, the way you're handling the image, there's a lot of long shots. This is not, I would not categorize this as a particularly cutty movie. Um, things really play out and you play in a lot of, you know, wide angles. And, and, uh, and I'm curious about sort of like what, how did you arrive at stylistically that kind of approach, which obviously gives Peter a lot of room to go impressionistic with the sound design? Yeah. I mean, some of it was, was practical as kind of Oscar and I went down to Kanash and knowing we had, you know, 12 days, we had, we had fought to get 18 days and it was like, not going to happen. You're going to have 12. So I wanted to know what our best approach, you know, would be. And, and I, I, I always have liked long takes. I always try and what I've, I've explored over the, over the years of making cinema is how the long takes can how could we we do the whole not like in 1917 but how can we do scenes in single takes but not become so uh not not that we're not aware of them but that we're not tired by them or that they're not showy that there isn't an effort to 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 be a director that says look I did this completely difficult orchestrated take that took so many moving parts you know uh uh but but actually that the audience would be able to like that there was a need for it um and and in the writing uh, and i you know i i visualized many you know how was how is this film on a steady cam how is this film on dolly track how is this film and knowing how how much i wanted to to give opportunity and room with sound to be so significant it began to feel very appropriate to pare it down um, to pare down the scenes and to create create the world in and of itself. It's like not only are the the humans significant uh, in this, but the car is significant and the the mountains in the background are significant, and you know the leaves rustling through the town are significant. So it felt really natural, and and I I, I can't remember what we oh we started with the truck sequence where he drives and he parks behind that's the first shot that we we shot of the film and that that wide landscape as it 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 pulls through and thinking about the sounds that would be prevalent as he pulls behind the bigger you know newer vehicle of the of the new person that that uh nikki has seen it felt so right to kind of see the power line that goes by you know i began to to really be like uh, this spatial relationship, we're observers, and then when we're going to go in, we're going to go very close. So it's really wides and close-ups throughout this film, and we, we don't really do mediums. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate you bringing that up. There's so many thoughts that kind of pop up for me. Um, I, I mean, I love one of the very first shots that we see of David is extreme close-up, you know, on, on his face when he's in the bedroom, um, you know, and then. You know, I, I'm I'm curious, Peter. You, you were talking about the music concrete. Can you give us a little bit of a taste of like specifically what are you doing to create those sounds? What 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 kind of you know what are you using to actually generate those kind of musical tones that we're that we're hearing specifically that that start in that scene where uh, David is running back to running back home. Something that uh, Robert and I talked about was rhythm that like often when you have abstract sounds, it becomes very droney and like, but what, what Robert and I talked about was like really working with rhythm in sound. So like, like having a pulse, having like significant sounds that kind of moves things along. Um, so that was where the car doors came in, like talk, talk dark and then starting just building a rhythm of that and then thinking okay so in between this i I'd, I'd like a metal screech okay i got these where we are like like hammering putting a big sledgehammer to like the roof of a car okay <laughs> okay so that's a nice sound to put in between the beats and so it's for me i built these kind of things very much with um, actual recordings. Uh, I don't really do. Uh, I don't have any synthesizers. I don't really have big sample setups or anything. I'm really like into 
um, recording lots of sounds and then exploring what to do with these the, like with these sounds like how can I really um, use the full potential in a way of the recordings that I made and um, I record sounds all the time and uh, uh, try to record fresh sounds for every project and for this film um, one thing was this whole musique concrète thing another big sonic thing is also the whole um, environment of this small small town of Kanosh and um, it was something we also talked about very early on and and Robert actually went there and recorded sounds ambiences there and uh, some of those are in the film actually like several of those are actually in the film and uh, I mean Hearing hearing the hearing the recordings of the place was super inspiring. The amount of cows mooing. Uh, I've I've never done a movie <laughs> with so many cows mooing. Um, so uh, there's all these uh, small elements that give give the place a very significant sonic personality. And uh, in that sense, there were like all these abstractions, the sonic compositions, and then there were uh, a lot of these uh, ambient atmosphere background layers, which throughout the film also evolves and have a lot of different tonalities to them as well. I'm happy that you, that you both talk about the importance of the location to the story and to the characters' mental states, and and you know, uh, you, you both talked about that that first sequence where David, you know, we, the first uh, uh, the first scene of the film, David is in you know Nikki's house, which is his old place, and then um, and then he sneaks out and runs back home to his dad's, where he's currently staying because they're they're in a trial separation, and you know, Robert, it how amazingly courageous to just play that entire run in one second but but it's really important because what you're t what you tell me as an audience member is like how small this place is and how on top of everybody and they all are and how up in each other's business everybody in this town is and it's really it's 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 a very clever smart way to kind of root that audience in a very specific place and let them know what the characters are going through. Yeah. The, thanks. Yeah. I, I knew it. It's funny that you bring that up <laughs> because in the early, early kind of discussions uh, of it, uh, the producers were kind of like, so you're going to put all the titles right here. It's going to be like starring playing Crawford and, you know, and I was like, no, we may put the title of the movie there, but I'm not, I'm not sure certain will will either do that, even do that. Um, this is really establishing this kind of state of mind. And there's, there's a lot of nervousness about that, but, but I wanted, yeah, I very much wanted the audience like you, we had kind of discussed to know very, or they need to know, like, it's like any type of game. You need to know the rules of the game as you begin, you know, charades is silly if you don't know that it's charades, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so... Um, I wanted to establish early on that we understood even that it, when the point where he shuts, you know, he puts the gun under the seat and shuts the door and the sound stops. It's like, uh, okay, the danger of this weapon has been established but that when it's with him, it, it's very a dangerous thing. And, and often we are with him all the time when that, when the, the weapon is always in proximity to him, when we begin to hear these sounds of kind of chaos, um, so things like that were were very, for me, very exciting. Yeah. Well, I, I want to dig a little deeper into 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 what you were just talking about. I feel like one of the one of the things that this film does really well is it uses sound design to communicate David's internal state. Um, and can you talk about, was that part of your, Robert, was that part of your conception when you were writing? Did you know that Peter was going to show up with that? Was that a delightful surprise that happened in post, you know, or, and, and, and why I, I, and on a deeper level, why is it important to use sound in that way? What did that accomplish for you? I, I mean, I think people, 
understand the power of a sound, but I think so often they're not aware of it. It, it, it. The example often is for for example in The Dark Knight, the Joker sets a pencil on a on a table and he grabs the back of this guy's head and he slams his head in it. You don't ever see the pencil enter the guy's head or any of those things that occur. You see the pencil and you see the the, the grabbing of the hand and the rest is done in sound. And we as an audience are horrified. I mean there there are there are scenes in films that I've been like I just did damage to myself experiencing those moments. And the reality is nine times out of town it's the sound, you know. And I watched <clears throat> I watched the behind the scenes stuff with uh, M Night Shyamalan talking about Sixth Sense, and he said initially the movie was rated R. <clears throat> and he didn't want it to be. So him and the sound guy some made some readjustments and then it was PG-13. <laughs> they did nothing to the actual edit. <laughs> and I thought this is, it, it's, it's such a powerful medium. Um, and so I was a little surprised. I, I'll say by Peter in the sense of, I didn't know what I was, you know, I knew what I wanted and I knew what I was hoping for, but but communication is also really challenging when you're creatively just moving into a, an arena that I can't just say, go watch 400 Blows and you'll know what I'm talking about, you know. Um, but what he brought, what he brought back again, the, the 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 sound design against the science. We've been talking about this the last two days that we've talked, you know, right before David, um, you know, chases after Derek. The truck drives away, and you hear the, the you hear the leaves blow, kind of in the wind, and how significant that little moment is against what what precedes it. You know, what comes after, which is this intense car scene. But I also knew from a directing standpoint, we didn't have the money to do maybe a car chase scene the way that would be traditionally done. But I knew if we established and did the sound design correctly and all elements, how the engine begins to, you know, like signify the temperature rising on him, how the cell phone would be the thing that pulls him away from not acting out, this, the, the, this alarm that reminds him he's a father. Those, uh, those elements would supersede not having the visuals to, to do probably what we would have standard done if we, you know, maybe if we had a million, three million dollars to make the film, we might have done these things a little bit different. But um, I don't know. I mean, I've just, my dad taught music for 45 years and he was a big, uh, you know, I have sheet music, the, uh, or he has, I, I, you know, but he would pull it out and it was just sheet music and this composer taking a, a like a Tommy gun and shot it. And then you were supposed to play where the where the bullet holes were in, in the pieces of music, you know, and he would lay in bed and, and take these naps on Saturdays and listen to whales just in underwater, you know. And so I think I think he embedded in me the very importance of of sound in and of itself. And I knew what what Peter could do would elevate, you know, uh, elevate it. There's something like very much about also how you, Robert, is like describing your characters. There's a complexity to the characters, which is like there's not really anyone who's good or bad, or there's no one who's really evil or really funny, or like there's often a multitude of feelings involved, and there's a complexity in the way that the characters um, act and what they say and what they do. And sometimes they do some things that are the opposite of what they're saying. And, um, and there's, so there's in that, in that sense, the, the way that, that you Robert is like um, making your, your, your characters and telling your story for me, that goes very well with having a, a film language that is not like that is not um, uh, uh, telling you exactly what you have to feel. Uh, it's really about the so much about the subtleties and often like 
there's layers that you where you at one point in the scene think that ah this will go this way but then it's heading another way um and i think by not using music in a film like this which is i mean it's an emotional drama it's a marriage story uh, by not using music in a film like this you, what happens is that there's nothing there to really guide your feelings to what you should feel you as an audience you have to find your own way into the story and into into the characters and that complexity also comes from using sound in this way because the sound um uh, tells stories that uh, is i mean it's often saying things that are not necessarily in the image um and it's uh, telling things that are not necessarily said with words um and in that sense like using sound this way i feel is in a way very natural when you do something it do the kind of storytelling that you do robert but at the same time it feels very bold and courageous because very few filmmakers do it this way because it's well and, and to your point peter i feel like you know if i may use the if i may use the term a, a lesser filmmaker would would lean on music to cue as you say to cue the audience as to how to approach a particular scene or and especially you know you, you i'm thinking about i'm thinking about that scene where uh david and derek bump into each other at the convenience store at the beginning of the film and and there again the music concrete element comes in there but but it's an extraordinarily you're, you're using sound design to build tension in a way that is really just powerful and it, i feel more powerful than if you had used music in that kind of in that kind of situation i i think the music is always kind of like as peter had said it it's overtly emotional, you know, our relationship to, you know, th even think about like C, C, G and D and how often that's the structure of pop music. So how, how comfortable we are with those three notes. We're just constantly very familiar with those and we're not familiar or comfortable with flats or, you know, sharps and we even have, you know, as my dad had taught once, you know, he would play this little this little melody on the piano and be like, you know, the Catholics like uh, banned this these three note structures as, as being demonic and evil. <laughs> um, and, and, and so we have this uh, already built in as a as a specific note will play our association or relationship to that and and I love music and 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 Peter and I are, are exploring like how that can maybe play play a role but it does immediately evoke uh, an emotional response where where I think the sound design and the concrete is like a is not it's it, it doesn't call back to a specific moment in time maybe the, maybe the the specific sounds maybe you know the, the you know the door shutting and slamming for example that that can bring us back to periods of like our own frustration where we have slammed doors or doors have been slammed on us and we then we almost a history is built into it um into these kind of experiences so i i mean i knew right away and and, and funny enough i don't think i explained it very well to peter i was teasing him the other day that when we were doing the found sound mix on uh at juniper he, he looked at me, I, I think it was like day two, and he's like, I'm kind of the composer. <laughs> and I realized that I hadn't ex explained it enough that, the, yeah, you would be, you know, you would, like this, the, the entire film film would be under his kind of, uh, his uh, mind, so. Just the way that, the, that you talk about something like when, when you have a, a collaboration like this, I mean, there's some people who really like that a director comes to you and says, I want this scene to play exactly like this. And I want this scene to play exactly like this. And Robert never says anything like that. He, we're talking about much more about the emotions of something or, 
what what we feel about a certain scene, but it's never. I mean, I don't think you ever, Robert, actually told me you have to put that sound into this scene. And for me, that opens up for uh, a really like it. It opens up for a process which is very creative because you have to um, you have to experiment to get there. You have to it it you have to explore things and you have to also risk things and you have to make mistakes and some of those mistakes are amazing and suddenly inspire something new. Um, and I mean, there's no kind of uh, there's nothing that's set in stone about sound design in a Robert Machoyan film. There's one sequence that I wanted to. Um talk with you about um because it, it it's such a remarkable use of sound to tell story but it's not at all flashy and it's it's not you know it's it's a very subtle scene i'm thinking about i just love this scene so much david uh is uh, david and nikki have date night and so they go out on a date um and then they pull back up at nikki's house uh, cause they're concerned about the kids and they're having a, they're having a pretty intense conversation in the car. And right at that moment, Nikki's new boyfriend, Derek pulls up with some flowers for her and gets into an altercation with their daughter in front of the house because the daughter is not happy to see him or take these damn flowers. So you made an unbelievable choice, Robert, to play that entire scene in the cab of the pickup with David and Nikki watching this whole scene happen you don't show them visually you're shooting out the you know out the cab of the, of the pickup watching this whole thing happen but you're also acoustically with that perspective as well so we can't really like the sounds kind of muffled because we're sitting in the cab of the pickup listening to this very tense exchange happen so we're not getting a hundred percent of the dialogue but we're getting the gist of what's going on and i almost feel like neither david nor nikki are even breathing while this is going on and it's just, uh, it's such an exciting scene from a, a storytelling perspective for sound. And was that, did you know that that was the way you wanted to handle that scene? You know, you know, while you were writing it, while you were shooting it, how did that, how did that particular treatment come together? Cause I, I just love that scene. Yeah. From, from a cinematic, uh, you know, cinematography standpoint, I did know early on that I wanted to, to go through the window and it was almost this idea in a way that that I would I would have a short film play out in the middle of yes. this kind of moment between the two of them, and so um, I knew I wanted it to be through the window, and that we would be we would be required to be with David and Nikki, and the, and that was that I knew was kind of it, when I was directing it. What I didn't know until I was really sitting in the editing room that got me very excited was the sound of their clothing and you can hear the discomfort and the, the rustle and the, you know, to me it was this, they both want to get out of the car and run away because they're in the most awkward experience that could ever have occurred between the two of them. So there were those elements that were very exciting for me to kind of play with sound wise, because I could only imagine. And, and again, by by not showing them the audience has then is also in the cab and their own maybe whatever their own experiences or their you know we all have these different levels of 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 tolerance towards a very awkward situations you know if i watch the british office i'm 5 minutes in and then i'm you know in the refrigerator oh i'm just i'm hungry i have to get something because because i'm so uncomfortable with with what's occurring and in this case, we would force the audience to be in the cab. And again, it would be them and not, even though that they are with Nikki and David, they have to bring their own experience kind of there. And I did, I, I knew we, we wanted to play the audio because I think in like one of the first passes, um, Peter did a really great job of making us be able to hear everything. And it was very, very clear and, and, and I, my response back was like, no, this has to be like, I want the audience to lean forward, you know, in a way it almost 
trying to hear, to hear the conversation, but it's not really about the conversation. You know, we probably could have played it just not hearing it at all. But I, but I knew I wanted like little bits of pieces because it was important to see how Jess was responding to this and that, that Derek wasn't being a dick. You know, that was the other part. He was kind of trying to navigate. I'm meeting my, my girlfriend's children, you know, oldest daughter for the very first time, which of course he knows a lot about. Um, and it's that awkward, I know you, who you are, you don't know who I am kind of moment. So there was a, we, we needed kernels of that, but as equally as important was, was the, the, the rustling of their jackets and this discomfort between the two of them trying to, to navigate the scene. So yeah, that was very exciting when it worked. It was very, very exciting. I can imagine. Yeah, we spent a long time in the mixing stage, mixing this sequence. Uh, David Barber, who was the, the great dialogue mixer of the film, I mean, he, I mean, he went through this like, and we were like, okay, so is this word the one that you want to hear, or like, maybe maybe this one over here, or like, and um, let's keep that one down, and then maybe that one is. I mean, it was constantly kind of trying to find the right balance between okay what do you need to hear and what don't you want to hear and suddenly a cloth rustle can be just the same i mean and the br breathings of like claim uh, crawford as david like it meant a lot like we were we did adr for his uh, breathings like by his by breathing mixing <laughs> uh, yeah yeah exactly and it meant so much for the scene so that you could feel for just the breathing. I mean, you listening to the breathing, you could tell how awkward the situation was and how it like hit him emotionally. Um, so it was, it's, it's amazing to be able to do a scene where it's these very, very tiny sounds that tell the story. It's, uh, it's often some of the hardest to do, um, but it's uh, incredibly, uh, um, evocative in a way and it, it really means that the audience is listening tell me a little bit about the mix um how long how many days did you have to mix did you pre-dub did you kind of just put everything up and kind of work your way through it or how did that process go and was robert there the whole time or did you come in after after a first pass had been made um uh, robert came to copenhagen like for like an kind of like an early pre-mix of effects and sound design but also just trying out things then um that, and that was two weeks two weeks before the actual mix which was in la um so i came to la and mixed with dave barber at juniper post and we i think we mixed for a week uh only but dave david had done a dialogue premix before this and while working on the dialogue premix he had uh, because i told him very early on, very early on that I, I want you to experiment, David. What we do in this in, in, in this film is that we try out things and we experiment with things. So David had this one scene, uh, which was um, the scene in the house where David arrives and the kids are in the, looking at the TV in the living room and you have the mom and the daughter in the kitchen. So he had tried for that scene to spread out the dialogue and pan it out. So that you had everything, like like everything, all the dialogue panned to where the different characters were placed in the image. And when I heard that, and when Robert heard that, we were just like, "Yeah, this is amazing. Let's do the whole film like that." Um, <laughs> and but the thing uh -huh. is that a lot of this was, I mean, a lot of the recordings in the film, a lot of the scenes were shot with sometimes just one radio mic and one boom mic. So what uh, David then did was this, he did a phenomenal job of like, he, we actually did this panning for every scene. Um, so there are scenes like where, where we only had one mic, for example, when like David is playing around with the kids and they are fire, they, they're shooting up the fireworks. And then what David did was he- Wait, 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 wait a second, wait a second. Yeah. That you're talking about that long scene in the park where they're f shooting off the the rockets. Yeah. 
So how, how, first of all, how long is that, is that, and you play it all out in one shot, right? But it's, my memory is that it's several minutes long. Yeah, I think it's four and a half, I think. Minutes, four and a half, four and a half, four and a half minute wide shot with four kids and David and they're firing off rockets. And you're saying you only had one microphone going? I think one microphone and then a radio mic for David. I mean, there's very, I think maybe also a radio mic for the, for for the oldest girl, but none for the and nothing for the small kids. So That's so amazing. So what David did then was using uh, the isotope software to um, then mm -hmm. uh, remove David's dialogue from the the recordings of the kids, and then being able to put the kids pan those to the right, and then removing mm -hmm. the kids' dialogue from David's dialogue and then panning David's dialogue to the left. Um, so we did a lot That's of amazing. tricks like that. And in, I mean, to create also this separation between the characters, which is very much kind of the whole story in the film, it's about the distance between the yes. characters. And when you suddenly had this panning of the dialogue, you were able to really feel how far away they were from each other so that even like when they were, I mean, when David was talking with his wife in front of the house and having that separation, suddenly you really feel how far apart they are. Well, it's you bring up something that's really interesting, Peter. And I, Robert, I wanted to ask you, I think, uh, you know, a very valid choice in this situation that we've seen directors do a lot is to shoot this movie in two, three, five right and you have one character on one far edge of the screen and one character on the other far edge of the screen and that's how you kind of impart that that separation and the distance and the space between the two of them but you decided to make this movie i mean it looks to me like four by three is that correct why so i'm really curious about that stylistic choice on the imaging side and why you decided four by three was the format for this story yeah i mean initially uh oscar and i had discussed doing 166 which is kind of my preferred aspect ratio um just being a photographer it, it gets closer to photographic kind of composition but when we when we did the close-ups on david driving it felt unnecessary to be able to see in front and behind of him you know it, it actually felt a little destructive in a way in, in the storytelling and when we went to four three we constricted his space so significantly that really you're, you're not even really seeing the steering wheel. You're just seeing his face and his shoulder. And, um, and Klain understood that, that performance in these scenes was just going to be on his face. And so he knew that he was going to be discussing with the audience, um, you know, what David was dealing with through kind of his, his, his facial gestures. So early on, it just felt so very appropriate to kind of conform. And, and, and then the other aspect, because 235 is this beautiful kind of landscape-esque, uh, which is what Westerns are normally um, kind of constricted to. But Kelly Reckard had done uh, Meek's Cutoff in 4-3, and she kind of discussed that, you know. And, and she kind of discussed kind of what we began to borrow from her, which is like, the, the photographs of that period of time are often square and, and even these cutoff might even be square. I'm not, I, I can't, I'm, I'm kind of drawing a blank right now, but what I thought would be very interesting is that it limited the distance because if Nikki and David get too far from each other, it's over and they're not in a, and not in a place where they, so the edges of the frame in a four, three, what's exciting is you're far away, but you're not so far that it, it no longer, you know, you're no longer connected. It it's almost feels over. more that you're, right. Yeah, and it feels f that you're forced in. The, the square is more confining as well, which was very exciting to me. I mean, that, those aspects very early on the the um, the scene where they're, they're they have their kind of first argument uh, over you know the fact that David came and knocked on the window so so early in the morning um, is a great example of that. The distance to which the actors themselves because we just set the markers for them and they knew that they couldn't they didn't have the freedom to go as far as they wanted which was very neat for us because then they they would they would reach this point no they were forced to turn around 
and you it almost then creates this dialogue of this confinement you know this confinement between the two of them so i i was very excited uh and and I I keep being hopeful. I think we're moving it into a place where I think aspect ratios can play a role in storytelling. Um, I mean, they always have, but but I was I, to be honest, I was nervous initially about the four three because it felt like it was becoming trendy, and I didn't want I didn't want it to play a role in trend. I wanted it to play a role in the, like deliver in the role in the right. way we told the story, and so. Um, luckily I felt like that was successful that, that not everyone did four three. So all of a sudden it was like this bandwagon of, of people doing four three. Cause I, I, I love how it was. Uh, absolutely. Peter, uh, did that create any issues that you had to be mindful of or did you play with that in any way? Cause obviously like if the image is four three and you're doing a 5.1 mix, you can, you can take the sound past the image, right? You can be, you can have, if you go hard left or hard, right, you're outside of the actual, field of the image at that point absolutely it was i mean in that sense it's it's uh, really interesting how like in some shots you i mean because of the confinement like like glenn like you mentioned in the uh, opening with the close-up of david you're i mean you're so close to the face and you don't really see anything else so you can have like just a very quiet breathing and it's really powerful but he can also be outside and you can suddenly open up the space like all around you. And I mean, I know that, uh, I mean, you can do amazing things with like Atmos and so on, but actually like uh, uh, you can do some of these things in 5.1 as well, this kind of spatial dynamics, which I really love that. I mean, one thing is that there's a lot of, there's a lot of loud and quiet moments in the film, like this this kind of loud, quiet dynamics. But there's also a lot of spatial dynamics, so that we go from something that is like mono almost and just like really up there on the screen, and then suddenly you're in this big room, like, and you're really like I'm also having uh, in the in a lot of these sound collages. There's weird echoes, like panning around you and like in that sense we really try to 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 think think a lot about the space and how 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 do we define space with sound and the the space that's defined by the visuals are not always the kind of space that we use for the sound but sometimes it matches and sometimes we do polar opposites so we constantly have this dynamic between uh, visuals and sound uh, in a great way. Yeah. yeah. I, this is one of the things I love about this film is that often the visuals and the sound are contrasting to each other in a way that's really delightful. Yeah. Robert, I have to ask you about the title of the film. Um, I went on an interesting emotional spiritual journey with the title of the film. <laughs> As I watched it, which is the title, you know, obviously the title sets an expectation for where the story is going. And you, you, um, you lead me to believe that I understand what that means from the very first sequence of the film when David is in the room with the two lovers with the gun. And then as I get to know these characters, I start thinking, oh God, I hope this isn't where this story is going. Because I think Peter, you pointed out that this is a, it's a complex story and these characters are really rich and they all misbehave to a certain degree and they all mess things up, but I like them all. And then by the end of the film, I've gone on a journey and I understand that there's a different meaning for the title. Um, and so I, I, it's kind of genius in a way. And I, Robert, I'd love for, I'd love for you to explain kind of how you lit on that and what the title means to you. Yeah, it's, it's, so there's a there's a reptile garden up in uh, I think it's South Dakota that I that I took my children to, and and we went to this one of the events is uh, is the alligators. There's like seven or eight of these alligators, and the the host comes out and stands kind of in the middle with all the alligators behind him, and we're sitting there and. Uh, as the as the host talks, you watch the alligators just slowly moving 
towards the host. And in the audience, you slowly see the phones start to come up to record. And just at the point where you think uh, this guy is in danger, he says, shame on all of you. <laughs> Your phones are coming up and none of you are telling me that the alligators have arrived. <laughs> <laughs> and then of course he goes and and you know handles handles the alligators and I, and I that experience has had such a profound kind of uh impact on me the awareness of of the host and 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 this uh watching the integrity of the audience you know and when I was really initially thinking about the killing of two lighter lovers as the title, it, it felt so appropriate, and it was kind of motivated by my my um, my brother in law, uh, who um, my my sister had been married before and had children with with, with somebody, and my my brother in law, she, the, the, the ex husband would call sometimes and be very mean, um, and he said to me once, he's like, "There's nothing I can do about it because." If I do anything, I, I'll lose, you know, I'll lose her. I can't beat up the father of her children, you know. Um, and I was really kind of, uh, you know, uh, you can see that in the story, but I was also like, oh, this interesting idea. And so uh, as I thought about uh, the title, which I also had another title called Prefab Family, which was like kind of a nod to Bella Tarr's Prefab People. Um the Killing of Two Lovers just set up like the it was the right with the opening scene written. It just felt like the audience understands the stakes and the title allows them even further to to understand the stakes. And when we arrive at the end of the movie, I've been honest to the title, but but the I have subverted the expectation to be so literal Um and, and I've gotten mixed, uh, to be honest, I've gotten mixed uh, re responses to it. Some people upset, you know, that, that what the title was didn't necessarily happen. Um, and I'm like, well, it, it did happen. It just, you know, <laughs> in a different way. It's kind of not the two lovers that you thought it was referring to. At least so that's, that, yeah. that's, that's what it meant for me. Um, so I really look, I, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, we've been talking, we, you know, we watched this movie a few days ago, my team, we can't stop talking about it. This is really, it's just, a, oh, it's just you. amazing filmmaking. I hope that a lot of people see this movie. Um, and I got to say, you know, one of the things I was so excited to have the both of you on this show to talk about this film, because I think that there's such a misconception among a lot of you know, young student, you know, f filmmaking students, but a, a lot of people in the industry that that creative sound design is really like, oh, that's something for like, you know, space movies or dinosaur movies or big budget tent pole. And I feel like I want to I want to use Killing of Two Lovers as like a case study of how important sound design is for, you know, any movie where you're taking the audience on a journey. Right. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's it's critical. Um, it's a critical tool. Uh, I have to say, for me, it's uh, you know, I, I was kind of saying this earlier. You know, as I was talking to the, to the producers, uh, and they were asking me what the budget for the sound was going to be, I said, you know, thirty thousand dollars needs to be the sound, and it's not enough money. But I'm going to beg Peter. So be aware that I'm. Like I'm begging and it was half of the budget and the, you know, the, the number itself is not the significant part, but the fighting to make sure it was half of the budget was really critical for me. Um, and they got a lot of resistance. They got a lot of, that's not what you do. That's not how it works. But I had read this article early on as a filmmaker where they did this test and they had, they, it was a 35 millimeter print with bad sound and it was a mini DV film with good sound and the audience picked the good sound. They'll they would rather tolerate a, 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 a low quality image than they would low quality sound. And it, and it's a, it's a critical tool. And again, the, the the car scene, you know, as you relate to a case study, uh, the chasing of Derek is a great example. I did not have the re we did not have the resources to shoot that in in the traditional cinematic ways. But I don't think the way we, we chose to shoot it distracts on any level. I mean, I think it even better. 
No, because you're using the sound to tell the story that you didn't necessarily have the money to shoot, which is another thing that I actually I talk to students a lot about, which is like, understand how powerful this story, can, this tool can be for you as a storytelling tool, because and this is a great example of like you can accomplish something with sound that maybe you couldn't afford to shoot. 100 percent. And you can take people on a, a very visceral journey as it relates as well. I mean, I, I think it's the, the our emotional senses. Again, we're we're so attuned to, to music music immediately doesn't takes away our right to 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 our emotional control you play a sad song unless you're cynical you're going to start being like oh this is so emotional like it removes our our freedom in many ways and sometimes i find myself frustrated if it's not earned you know it's i remember uh, you know benjamin button at the very end of that movie being so very angry because I was like, yes, I'm I'm about to cry, but not because of what uh, I've experienced, but because the music has has like removed my control of emotion. <laughs> and I think sound design does the opposite of that. I mean, I think it, it guides you along, but it has to be earned as well. You know, there, there's an earning of like what's on screen, what is on performance. How is this? How is sound design supporting those things? I mean, in this film, it's very overt, but it's supporting what's happening in David's life. It's not forcing the audience to feel a specific way as a result of it. So, yeah, I mean, I would advocate for it consistently and for fighting for a lot of a lot of days with the, with your sound designer. Yeah. Well, Robert, um, you know, you, te you, you teach at Brigham Young University. What are you teaching your your young students about sound? We constantly will talk about, you know, the significance where we look at scenes and we try and break down how the sound is motivating specific things. Or, again, things that you believe that you've seen that you have not seen, you've heard, and as a result created um, the, ideolo the ideologies that those things really are occurring. Uh, and, I, and I think in great cinema, you know, people will either use it very overtly or very subconsciously but regardless when it's when it's working so very well we're not so focused on it in in the sense of like it's happening and maybe you're not like oh that's a really cool dog barking in the far distance you know but what's happening is you're in the world i mean i mean often people say about killing two lovers it feels very real you know they're like this feels real and it feels like we're in the environment did you, did you just have your actors running around making stuff up you know, and 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 maybe the long performances have to do with that. But I think it's also that when you're listening, you're you're hearing the wind blowing, you're hearing the leaves rustling, you're hearing cars five miles away. You know, <laughs> the layers of which you exist, you're there. As opposed to often, sometimes when you when you watch films or or some films that I pay attention to, they've removed they've removed the room. You know, and really, it's like you almost only hear the dialogue and maybe you hear the clicking of a doorknob. And and for me, I think it's critical to build those spaces because because then you're there. Yeah, it was actually an element that we were playing with in the sound design as well in the background sounds and the ambiences. I really love this thing where you, if if you have a sound that's playing far away in the distance, it's really hard to kind of make out what it actually is. Like so, you can have like a weird metallic screech, or you can have a we use trains in this film, like trains in, I mean, way in the distance. And like when I suggested to Robert that we like, sh sh let's use some trains because I love train sounds. Um, Robert was like, but there's no trains there. And I was like, they can be in the, in the distance. Like, so it's, we have all these sounds. Stop being so literal, Robert. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we can, we can do thing. We we can we can have these sounds that play far away because they create this feeling that 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 I mean, you're listening for small sounds and you're kind of trying to make out what. So was that a cow moo or was that a weird train sound? Was that a truck alarm? Like what what are yeah. what what is happening out there? So we do that a lot in this film. And I mean, I, I found, I mean, sometimes when I look through my sound library, instead of looking for specific sounds, I look sometimes just for emotional sounds, like a weird right. screech or something. I forget what it originally was when I recorded it or 
someone recorded it. It's it doesn't matter what it is anymore. It matters. It matters what the the emotion is. And uh, there's a lot of sounds in that in in the film like that where it's just like there's a weird screech or like is that a deer getting killed or is that a train <laughs> going off the rails or like. Um, and I think it creates this depth into the environment as well, because you, as an audience, you're really listening. Yeah. Well, uh, Peter, Robert, you guys have been very indulgent. I suspect we may have talked about the sound of the film longer than the actual running length of the film itself. But um, <laughs> there was just so much good stuff to talk about with this film. I just I can't I can't emphasize enough what a, how, how much I, I, I love this film. And obviously it's opening. Uh, in theaters and on VOD. I hope everybody gets a chance to experience uh, this film. It's quite a remarkable achievement uh, for the both of you. And you. I can't wait to see, obviously you guys are continuing to collaborate. Um, you're, you're already a couple of projects down the road from The Killing of Two Lovers. I, I can't wait to see what, uh, what you guys are working on next. Yeah, it's, it's very exciting. I, I have to say, we've been talking a lot this week about the new film and and every discussion is, is very exciting. So oh, we'll be excited to share it for sure. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, thank you guys again for taking the time and joining us on the podcast. It's been a, it's been a great pleasure talking to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Glenn. Thanks. So once again, I would like to thank Robert and Peter for joining us to discuss this uh, amazing film and the amazing sound work in it in so much detail. And special thanks to our friends at Neon for helping bring this conversation together and for supplying us with the clips that we played during the interview. So definitely check this movie out at an art house cinema near you or right at home on Video On Demand. It's really uh, just an original film and just an amazing use of sound as a storytelling tool. Uh, we have links as always in our show notes. We'll be back again in two weeks, so make sure you're subscribed if you're not already. You can find links to our dedicated podcast feed in the show notes or by searching for Dolby wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, please consider leaving us a rating or a review in the Apple Podcasts app. It really helps raise awareness for our podcast so that we can continue to grow. Until then, thanks again for joining us. This has been Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast. I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry. Production support is by Taylor Hines, and our production coordinator is Tristan Enriquez. Thank you for listening. <laughs>